In the last few videos, we've been talking about different formulations of the incompressible Navier-Stokes equations. We focused on the primitive variables formulation for velocities and pressure. Then we focused on the vorticity stream function formulation, again, for incompressible Navier-Stokes. I want to show you a more general formulation of the Navier-Stokes equations called the conservation formulation. It's often used in compressible flows, as we'll discuss. Now the first thing I want you to be aware of is conservation obviously is a very important principle in engineering and science. And so by using the term conservation for this formulation does not in any way imply that the other formulations do not conserve mass, and momentum, and energy, and so on. They do. It's just a different formulation and it has this name for reasons that you'll see in a moment. So now for compressible flows we also need the density. It's no longer constant as is the case for the incompressible case. So we will have a row for the density, and this is, again, the so-called conservation form. So here's the general form of the 3D Navier-Stokes equations. Everything with the time variable is in U, everything with the next variable is in F, Y is in G, Z is in H, everything else is in the J, the forcing term. So the U is a vector, and it's just a list of all the conserved variables. So we have rho, which is the density, that comes from the continuity equation, and we have the momentum fluxes in the x, y, and z direction. So these are the conservation or flux variables, the stuff going into and out of each cell control volume in the fluid. So that's for the time derivative. Now for the x derivatives, you'll see some similarities. Again, the first element in the vector is from the continuity equation. That's the same for g and h. And then we have x momentum, y momentum, and z momentum. You'll recognize the pressure term here. We have the viscous terms I'm just representing as shear stresses using the double subscript notation. And then this term, the rho times u star squared, that comes from the convection terms. Now you notice a difference here with the u squared. We'll talk about that in a moment as well. So very similar variables for f, g, and h derivatives of x, y, and z. And then the j is, of course, everything that's not differentiated. And those are all the source terms. Body force terms due to gravity or electromagnetic fields, magnetohydrodynamics, or whatever happens to be driving the flow. So there is no contribution. There is no source term in the continuity equation. Then the rho fx, fy, and fz in the x, y, and z. So these would be the forces in each of those three directions. So if we were to write those down, the continuity and then the momentum equations in our usual vector form, they would look like this. So remember, all the dependent variables show up in U, and those are the quantities that are being conserved within a little control volume. The control volume corresponds to a little cell in our grid. The continuity equation then in vector form looks like this. It's partial rho, partial t, plus del dot, so the divergence of the density times v star, that is the velocity, is equal to zero. Notice if the flow is incompressible, such that rho is a constant, it doesn't change with time, it's a constant here, can be eliminated, and we just have del dot v is equal to zero, as we had for the incompressible case. So again, that's the continuity equation enforcing conservation of mass for our compressible fluid. The momentum equation is given here, it looks somewhat similar to the momentum equation we had earlier for the incompressible case, but I'll point out some differences. So here's the unsteady term. Then we have del dot rho v times v. So this is the rest of the convection terms, but it looks different than what we had in the incompressible case. There we had v dot del v. Here we have del dot rho times v times v. So we'll come back and look at that in a moment. We have the pressure gradient term. We have the viscous term. Again, in terms of now the stress tensor, you would need to include a constitutive law to relate the stresses to the strain rates, such as a Newtonian fluid or whatever type of fluid it happens to be. And then you also have here rho g. That would be the body force due to gravity, the effects of gravity that comes from the j, where the force f is the acceleration due to gravity. The main thing I want you to see is how we've represented the convection terms here differently than in the incompressible case. Okay, I have a bunch of comments about this formulation. I'm not gonna say a whole lot about this because our focus is primarily on incompressible flows, finding difference methods for them, and so on. But I want you to be aware of this conservation form for reasons that I'll mention in a moment. So it follows directly from a control volume derivation of Navier-Stokes. 
Navier-Stokes is F equals MA applied to a control volume. You'll notice one of the nice things is it actually consolidates all of your equations into this one vector form. So even continuity is incorporated into this one equation with all of the variables included in those vectors. Third, it clearly exposes quantities that are conserved. That's why it's called the conservation form. So we're conserving these quantities across the surfaces of the control volume. Mass coming in minus mass coming out has to equal the change in mass inside. Same thing with momentum. So that is being directly enforced in this conservation form. One of the main advantages numerically is that in this conservation form, whereas primitive variables, for example, across, say, a shock wave, the primitive variables have a step change. Velocities change abruptly, densities change abruptly, and so on, but the product of the two does not. So whereas a velocity or a density might be discontinuous, the conservation variables are, remain smooth, and of course that's good for numerical calculations. Now I've shortchanged this formulation just a bit because if I'm truly looking at a compressible flow, I also need to calculate the energy equation for the temperature. In order to know the density, I need to know the temperature, so I need an additional equation, the energy equation, which looks very similar to the momentum equation without the pressure gradient. That would just simply add one more variable in our vectors, the u, f, g, and h. Now if you were to carry out this differentiation in this conservation form and make the appropriate assumptions for incompressible flow, you would get back the incompressible form that we've looked at earlier. So everything's completely consistent. There's no new physics other than the fact that we're allowing for compressibility here, but we just have a different formulation with some particular advantages and disadvantages. As I said before, we do have to have a constitutive relationship that relates the stresses to the strain rates to write down the stresses in terms of the velocities. This is also the basis for the finite volume method. If you take this conservation form and you integrate it over your control volume, so you integrate along the control surfaces and over the domain, that leads to the finite volume method. So we're doing finite differences primarily. There's a complementary finite volume approach which is very popular, very common, and particularly in commercial and some open source codes. ANSYS Fluent uses the finite volume method. OpenFOAM uses finite volume methods. And that's obtained by integrating this conservation form over the control volume. Now in the next video, we need to think about how do we solve these coupled partial differential equations. In earlier chapters, we looked at solving a single elliptic equation or a single parabolic partial differential equation. But now we have coupled PDEs, some of which might be elliptic, some of which might be parabolic, but they're coupled together and we need to think about and talk about how would we solve these coupled PDEs using methods based on those earlier techniques for single PDEs, but how do we deal with this coupling? So we'll talk about that in the next video.